Thanks very much, Andrew, and pleased to be here today. Today, I'm just going to be cantering through some information on how we can use data from ship inspections. I fully appreciate ship inspections are a fairly dry subject, but this is more about data, which arguably is also rather dry. But uh, what I want to do is just explain how we can use the data from the inspections in a more aggregated fashion. And this all relies on having a structured data set in the first place. So just a little bit about Edworld to set the, set the scene and give some context here, is that we are, yes, we are a ship inspection company, but we are also a technology and data business. So the inspections we do, which is what we are best known for, are the tip of the iceberg, if you like. There's a huge amount of time and investment in data. We have PhDs in data science working for us and technology. And when I talk about technology in this context, that is software developers, product designers, UX, etc., which is how we bring our products to the market. So I think I may have missed one slide here. OK, so another bit of sort of stats on Idwell is that in 2023, of all the ships bought and sold, 45% were done on the basis of an Idwell report. So put simply, of every IMO that changed hands last year, IMO number, 45% were done using an Idwell inspection report. We have been on board more than 15% of the world fleet since 2019 and taken a structured data set for those ships. No one else in the industry has anything close to that. In fact, no one else takes a structured data set when they go on board ships in the way Edwell does. We deliver 15 reports per day. We are doing supervised machine learning to be able to predict the grade and subgrades of over 60,000 IMO numbers across the world fleet. Uh, we have five global offices worldwide. We can inspect in more than 100 countries. And critical to this conversation is that we have over 100 million, sorry, over 10 million data points uh, in our data warehouse. So the Edward grade, I think, is something that a lot of people in the room will be familiar with. A lot of people think that it always sits around mid-70s. Actually, that's a misnomer. The Edward grade can go from as low as 30 to as high as about 96, I think, is the highest grade we've ever seen. The reason you predominantly see grades in the mid-70s is because those are the reports that make it out to the market generally. But actually, there is a huge variety of the grade. Also, it's not just the grade that we need to focus on. Beneath the grade are two high-tier subgrades, one for the asset condition and one for the management of the asset. Below that, a further 19 subgrades, which focus on things like hull and machinery, or, sorry, hull condition, engine room machinery condition, crew welfare, forthcoming regulatory compliance, all of these having their own grading system beneath. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to talk about three different ways that we can use data. The first one is M&A intelligence, and this actually happens a lot more than you would expect. So examples of this, if we go back a few years, we, uh, we, we did a due diligence project for the merger between International Seaways and Diamond Air Shipping. We did the mass capital acquisition, or sorry, the Entrust acquisition of the mass capital portfolio. Earlier this year, we did the, uh, the ADNOC LNS acquisition of Navigate. So it happens more than you would realize that either on the buy side or the sell side, there is a requirement for a due diligence project, which is more than just asset inspections. So the challenges of these projects is first and foremost is having technical expertise and when going on board the ships. It also needs to be a comprehensive due diligence process. The inspection methodology we adopt has to be standardized. I'll talk about that a little bit further later. Uh, there need to be thorough compliance checks in the process, and we've got to integrate the advanced technology we've got to save time and resources for the client. So a case study of what we've done here was actually last year in 2023, we did a project where this was a sell side technical due diligence project where the owner had 120 ships. 
We use that supervised machine learning I talked about to predict the grade of 118 assets. Once we'd done that, we were able to take a sample of 20% spanning the best performing, lowest performing, and middle performing ships. We physically went on board, therefore, 24 ships. So we had all of the reports on the 118 ships, remote reviews of class records, photos, documentation, etc., and then physical inspections. But more importantly, we had the summary report, which took into account how those ships benchmarked to industry average across, you know, comparing supermaxes with supermaxes, similar age, similar yards, etc. Shipping being shipping, there were nuances. Some of the ships were doing cabotage trade, so we had to take into account that things like ballast water treatment system and IHM requirements weren't valid for those assets in the current trading pattern. But of course, the potential buyer would maybe have needed to, uh, would have taken those ships out of cabotage trade. So we were able to nuance it. The outcome of this was buyers purchasing reliance from us on the, uh, on the due diligence, and it effectively facilitated a quick transaction. Ultimately, what was wanted here was for the buyers to be able to get a quick, concise overview of the acquisition, not to have to read 120 detailed reports and look through all the photo packs. Um, it was all there if they needed it, if they wanted to dive down, but we were able to do it at various levels using the data that we had taken or scraped from those inspections. So the takeaway here is that using a standardized and AI-driven approach to the ship inspection process enhances data reliability and consistency and enables both financiers and owners to make more informed M&A decisions. So the next, next area I want to talk about is driving condition improvements. Uh, earlier this year in January, we launched a, a, new, uh, a new product to the market called Idwell ID. And this is talking about how we are using that to drive condition improvements for owners. So it came about because of the core challenges we were hearing from our clients, whether that be charterers, financiers, or owners. And those challenges were that there was a lack of standardized vessel condition assessment. There was inefficient defect management and maintenance planning. For those who are more on the technical side, I'm not talking about planned maintenance systems here. I'm talking about people who are looking to have oversight of the management, not the detail of the management. Vetting and charterer compliance and safety risks, having visibility into fleet condition. And then, quite importantly, we found actually the ability to demonstrate the fleet value, and I'm talking about the technical value, which has a direct correlation to the asset value of the ships externally, whether that be to a charterer or shareholders or financiers and investors. So how did we overcome that challenge? So there's three key aspects to how we've done it. Firstly, you have the surveyor. In the previous panel, they were talking about companies who, which are asset light, finding it very important to look after their people. We treat surveyor management in the same way most ship owners will treat crew management. It's onboarding process, it's regular webinars, seminars with them, it's feeding back, it's continuous professional development, all those sort of things. So getting someone who goes on board the ship with a standardized approach, who knows how to deal with the crew to make sure they get the best information out of the crew is absolutely critical because that's the first point at which you are interacting with the asset. The next stage is the checklist or the inspection itself. Now, again, the traditional approach of shipping is that you go on board, you look for problems, you take photos and you write it down. To get that inspection to be standardized and so that you can take structured data, it requires a different approach. So what needs to happen is you need to have a smart checklist, if you like, which when you are recording the data from the inspection, you are focusing on catalog data sets. So not just there was corrosion spotted in ballast tank three starboard. It's more things like what percentage of corrosion, was it scattered, was it pitted, so that you've then got a data set that you can refer back to in the future. So the inspection needs to be on a checklist where you can collect data from it, and that checklist needs to be regularly updated. 
So we are constantly working with our partners to talk about what their requirements are on the checklist, making gap analysis. When we see, stand, when we see <coughs> clients continuously asking for similar questions, we adopt them into our standardized or our, our base checklist. Uh, it's also then important that it's not just the checklist. Someone needs to standardize that. The view of an Indonesian surveyor versus a Danish surveyor on the standard of gym equipment could be very, very different. So once the inspection is done, the checklist is completed, that is uploaded into a portal and then received by our centralized technical team of master mariners and chief engineers. They then review it and standardize it under very strict guidelines. So looking at the corrosion to check the percentages given are correct. As I say, making sure that the gym equipment is given on a standardized approach speed of internet, which I'll be talking about later, having parameters to which, of which to standardize in the data set. So the case study on this one is that we are working with a number of owners here, um, and that varies from container companies like CMA, CGM, London listed entities like Tufton Oceanic, who are using external management, a number of owners here in Singapore using internal management, and one specific company also based in here with 100 ships who have five separate management arms, ship management arms, some external, some internal. We're inspecting the ships on a regular basis. The lower performing ships we will do on a six monthly cycle, the higher performing ships on a 12 monthly cycle. So yes, they get the detailed inspection report and the defects, but they also get access to the IDWAL ID platform. When they log into the ID platform, they get a bird's eye view of their fleet. They are able to see how the ships are performing but on a scatter graph effectively with the age of the ships and the grade of the ships. They can filter the data so they are comparing their Chinese built ships with other Chinese built ships aged 12 to 16 years old, built at Waigao Chow for Cape sizes. All of that is filterable so that you can get a like for like comparison. And what it's allowing them to do is to manage the manager to benchmark OPEX versus the technical output for the ships. I'm sure a lot of people in this room have seen OPEX benchmarking reports, but you don't see technical benchmarking reports. The Edwell ID platform allows clients to do that on a dynamic basis. So the key takeaway on this one is leveraging comprehensive and standardized inspection protocols with advanced data management platforms enhances transparency ensures regulatory compliance, and optimizes operational performance. What we've seen is we've seen an improvement in port state control inspection uh, for assets under the Edwell ID program, and our clients are feeding back that actually it's really helping them to manage their OPEX budgets as well. Finally, just to talk a little bit now about ESG transparency, I'll be focusing predominantly on the S. But uh, this is something that Edwal are very passionate about, ESG in general. We are a carbon neutral organization. A, we, offset, we, we burn a lot less, uh, or we create a lot less CO2 based on the fact that our surveyors are local to the inspections. But the CO2 that we do create, we offset. Um, we're also very close to the, uh, the seafarers themselves. A lot of seafarers work for Edwal, so it's a cause that we're very supportive of. So the challenges in the ESG space are, first of all, getting accurate assessments, secondly, is standardize, standardizing the reporting, and finally, is actually integrating the insights from that. So in March of this year, we introduced or we brought to market the IDWAL Social Impact Report. This is downloadable from our website, and I'd recommend for people to have a look at it if you're interested. So, it took a snapshot of data from the 14th of April 22 to the 25th of September 23. It went across all of the main ship types and it looked at 10 pillars of social standards. And I'll go through those, those, those pillars now. It, well, uh, the next slide. So firstly, and this sort of goes back to the grade range, the best ship scored an 87.7 on the social impact rating. The worst ship scored a 34.7. Perhaps not surprising, it was Mongolia flagged. As you can see on the right hand side, you have the spread of, uh, of social impact grades that we saw for the fleets. And this is again, this sort of data led approach. The report was actually made by our data team, interestingly as well, rather than by our technical seafaring team. 
So of those 10 pillars, which you see going from admin on board, comfort, all the way through to workload, the two worst performing areas were connectivity and recreation, which are actually two key, key critical areas for seafarers. Recreation is not a difficult one to get right. Access to uh, basketball hoops or barbecues, we found se severely lacking, actually. But connectivity is something that also is, in this day and age, you know, we're, we're all connected the whole time, and for seafarers not to be connected is bordering on criminal, I would say. So why did connectivity score so badly? It scored a 5.4 out of 10 on average, and you can see again the spread on the right-hand side. We were looking at access to Wi-Fi and then speed. Sorry, skip two here. So on the left-hand side here is the whether it was provided on board. You'll see by far the biggest bar says, yes, it was provided on board for free, great, but it was limited, and it was highly limited in many instances. So it wasn't giving the crew freedom to access that we all have on shore. And then on the right-hand side was the speed, and the average speed was akin to dial-up, to be clear. So for those who remember, that was, uh, that was not, not a fast internet experience. The other thing we're able to do with this data is to start looking at, you know, as I say, that 15% of the world fleet we've been on board. We can start looking at who the best performers are. So pleased to be here in Singapore and to show that actually the highest performing flag was the Singapore flag on the social impact report, but we can also start looking at countries of build, we can look classification societies, et cetera. And that's the sort of power of this standardized set of data we have within Idwell. As I say, we also know who the worst performers are, but it doesn't go down very well to start talking about that, so we focused on the best performers. Before I go to the, oh, I don't know, I'll go through the takeaway and then there's one more slide at the very end. Find it. Sorry, there's some double skipping going on here. So the takeaway here is that accurate and integrated ESG transparency is essential for sustainable investment and operational decisions in the marine industry. We're really trying to raise the bar. We're talking to the banks about Poseidon principles. We're talking to owners about ESG reporting. We grade E, S, and G separately and give an overall ESG grade for ships as well. And it's something that we're very keen to push that agenda. So if people are interested to discuss that further, I'd be very pleased to. One final thing I would like to show is two cabins that we've inspected, or sorry, two cabins examples. On the right-hand side, we have a, a, one of the better cabins, really, that we've inspected on board a ship. On the left-hand side, a much more impressive cabin, which is actually a Swedish prison cell. And what we're trying to get at here is to raise the plight of seafarers. I regularly get conversations, oh, you've downgraded my ship because we don't have ensuite facilities for our crew. We say, yes, that's correct. Ships, many ships do have ensuite facilities. Oh, but Japanese-built ships don't. Well, is the problem that you want a Japanese ship and you go to the Japanese builders and you accept that they won't put ensuite cabins because they build as cheaply as they can? Or should you actually be addressing that with the shipyard and pushing the shipyard to build to a standard which looks after your crew? And this is the sort of agenda that we're trying to push using data as well. I think that's it from me for now, but if anyone's interested in what we're up to or understanding more, either myself or my colleagues would be very pleased to discuss with you. Thank you very much.